in the earliest part of the ministry of Jesus Christ, he sent out his disciples in twos and he instructed them to teach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Deliverance is not through sacrifice but through faith. Faith in something that the disciples before meeting Jesus never knew anything about. They were quite surprised by his teaching and never really understood it as they dis went along doing exactly as he bid them. One of their greatest surprises was when he told them that in the kingdom of heaven women are just as important as men. Oh, this was quite a shock. They weren't used to anything like that. They thought the man ran the family. The man ran the world. The man did the dictating. The man said, this is what we should do. Jesus said, oh no, no. God is no respecter of persons. In the kingdom of heaven, male and female are one and the same. Now that was quite a shock to them. In a lesser way, it's quite a shock to us to learn the truth about the beautiful things in life. When we are told that a rose is no more than a rose, name it and drop it, it's as if someone had said to us, destroy all the beauty in the world, lock yourself up away from it, close your eyes to it and never see it again. But it's far from that. As we begin to look closely at the revelation that a rose is a rose is a rose, along comes the words, the fragrance, the texture, the shape, the size, the color, the beauty that you see is your own consciousness. God did not put that rose there. Your consciousness put that rose there. That rose is going to fade. Then what are you going to say? And we dwell on that a bit. What are they trying to tell me? So Joel says, well, when the rose fades, what have you got? If all you have seen is a material rose, or even your mental concept, which you call a rose, and we find that there is a love that sent that rose to you, when the blossom fades, the love is still there. That begins to permeate our consciousness a bit. And now we think of somebody sending us a dozen roses. Yes, the roses will pass away, but the one who sent the roses to us with love is still there. And that love is present ever. But now we go another step. Who sent the roses to your garden? The same love that sends someone a dozen roses is the love that sent roses to your garden. The love that put flowers throughout this universe. The love that put cattle on a thousand hills. The love expressing all that we interpret as visible form. And we become aware that there is an infinite, unending, impersonal, impartial love ever pushing forth its expressions in multitudinous ways which we are seeing as a rose here, a forest there, a brook here, a person there. All of the things that we are seeing are our interpretations of this invisible power of love. Now then, the purpose of telling us that a rose 
is a rose and nothing more is to make us understand that in glorifying the form of the rose we are still in that consciousness of the mind which is not aware of the invisible presence the essence the reality which we are interpreting in our minds as the form of a rose we are being lifted above our mental impression into a transcendental realm where we can glorify not the form of the rose but the creator through whom this appearance of that form became possible we are told to sow to the source and not the effect but why why must we learn to do that we're very content with our roses knowing this isn't going to improve our feeling about the beauty of the rose but you see it's a two-sided coin and while you are content to look at the rose to glorify the form that same mind which is doing this must also glorify the other side of the coin and must glorify the forms of disease as well the forms of poverty as well the forms of evil as well because the moment this mind identifies the rose as beautiful identifies the form as lovely it is saying that this flower over here which is rather nice is not as beautiful as this flower over here <coughs> and to that mind this is fine this is a beautiful flower and this is pretty but not as beautiful but isn't God there and there and therefore the mind in segregating the two in identifying one as more beautiful than the other is saying that God is perfect or beautiful here but not so perfect here and the mind is unaware of its inability to see the beauty that is present in both areas and it instead is leveling the world down to its level of awareness now to be lifted above my judgment that beauty is here and less beauty is here to the realization that God is not less in any place this is part of the reason for being taught to judge not to let ourselves look without judgment and let the spirit define itself in our world of judgment we imprison ourselves in those judgments we judge the good and we judge the evil and always we are denying the omnipresence of the spirit we are denying the perfection of God in all things we are bringing the infinite down to our very finite concept and the only one who suffers from our inability to let the spirit define itself is us and so we become very capable of distorting our blessings on the one hand we discover the great marvels in the atom and then we distort it into a great world fear of an atom bomb we discover all kinds of abilities to fly for example and then we use the ability to fly to devastate other cities always we find the great waters on the earth and we find a way to pollute them in our judgment we look from the limited finite mind and always someone must come along with a shocking truth 
that as long as you are in your judgment of beauty, you are denying God's judgment. You are in unrighteousness. You are in the limited concept of life, and you are shutting yourself off from the unlimited. Now we have heard about people who talk to flowers. And we have heard about people who talk to animals. We have heard about people who talk to the forest, to the trees, to the sky, to the elements. There is something about these people which has discovered a way of communing with the invisible which others have not discovered. There's a place in Job where Job seems to be aware that there is a way to commune with other life. And this is how he says it. It's a passage that we have all walked by, not realizing it was a great revelation of the allness of life. Job says, But ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought them? In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Now, if you will look at a rose in another way, If you will ask the rose, if you will ask the flower, you will discover another great shock, almost as shocking as, or perhaps just as shocking, as the disciples discovering that women are just as important as men in the kingdom of heaven on earth. We are under the assumption that there are higher forms and lower forms. We, of course, being the higher. But in spirit, we learn that we are a spiritual being and that all that exists is spiritual being and the illusion of a higher form and a lower form is completely crucified. We are no higher than the ant. We are no lower nor higher than any other form on this earth. And it would be a marvelous thing for us when we come into that realization. It reminds me of that great story by J. Allen Boone. When you read it years ago, Kinship with All Life, you may not have been ready to fully comprehend the spiritual significance of what he had discovered. And so I want to review it very briefly so you can see that even before there was an infinite way, there was a oneness understood by certain individuals on this earth who had caught the fact that a rose, a dog, a moon, a star are much more than they appear to be. A rose isn't just something that beautifies gives off a fragrance. It is a doorway. And if you learn to walk through that doorway, you walk into a promised land. It is a window to the face of God. And not only is the rose that, but every person you meet and everything you see is another window to the face of God. Everything on this earth is a doorway to the infinite. And when you become aware of it, you learn to do what this man, Boone, learned to do. He was given this famous dog. This was before RKO theaters. RKO was a, a moving picture producing company. In fact, it was in the days of Douglas Fairbanks Sr., and he was given this dog, Strongheart, which had performed very valiantly in the war. 
was an exceptional police dog and combat dog. And the owners had trained the dog, and now they were compelled through some commitments to go elsewhere for three or four months, and he had to take care of the dog, and he didn't know what to do about it. Just how they get along, and all that. And so the very first night he found out his problem. Here was this dog, and he just didn't know where it was supposed to sleep. And so he moved over to one side of the bed, figuring he'd let the dog make his own decision. And he did. He jumped right into bed. That's 125 pounds of dog. And the next thing he knew, the dog was turned the wrong side up. Head where tail should be and tail where head should be. And he thought, what am I going to do about this? The next thing you know, there was some automobile down the street making some special noises, and up jumped the dog, and as he did, out fell the man. And this went on three times. Every time a street noise developed, the dog would leap up, ready, alert, to attack, and the man would fall out of bed. He decided to have a talk with the dog. And so the only way he could think of doing it was to say, now listen here, look here. I'm here to take care of you, but I'm the boss, not you. Now, I've told you three times, I want your head where the pillow is. And three times you've disobeyed me. I can understand you're jumping up because you've been trained in combat to do that. But as far as where you put your head and your tail, that's my business, and I'm telling you what I want. And he stared at the dog, and the dog stared at him. The next thing he knew, the dog gently put his jaws around the man's hand and drew him to the window. And then the dog let go of the hand and took the French curtain in his jaws, lifted it up, and let it drop back. Suddenly the man understood. The dog was going to leap through that window at any intruder. And he had laid in the bed a certain way with his head facing that window because that was his quickest way to get through the window if he had to. And he was doing it all to protect the man because that was his function. And so he had laying in bed the opposite way, only to protect the man quicker and more effectively. As soon as they turned the bed around, everything was right again. He found the dog could communicate with him and hear what he had to say. And as they went on, he discovered a strange quality in this dog. This dog seemed to be able to read his thoughts. And so regardless of what he was thinking, the dog was reacting to those thoughts. And it gave him a great pause to wonder how could the dog read his thoughts. One day he had an opportunity to do something about it. He had decided that in order to learn how to train the dog, he had to give the dog more latitude because the dog seemed to have the ability to think, to communicate, and to make intelligent decisions. So they'd worked out a plan that daily they would go out on some kind of an excursion, but on one day the man would pick the place, and he'd be the boss that day, and on another day the dog would pick the place, and he'd be the boss that day. And so on one of the days when the man was boss, the dog somehow wouldn't get into the car, refused to go. And he got the idea that the dog had a better idea wanted to be the boss that day, and he said, all right, if that's what you want, we'll go your place. And that's exactly what the dog wanted, and so he followed the dog. And they went up many strange areas, through a ravine and through some pathways that were not pathways to the public, and finally they came to an altitude where they could stand on the top of a mountain looking down. And the dog sat there in silence, just staring out, the man got the idea the dog was in meditation. He could hardly believe it. And then he thought he'd steal around to find where the dog's eyes were looking at. And he did, and to his surprise, the eyes of the dog were not centered on any particular object on the earth below, but rather on the horizon, right above the clouds, just fixedly staring at that place. He thought, this is a very strange dog. Now let's see, he said, all of a sudden in an inspirational moment, he thought, he's been able to read my thoughts. Let me see if I can commune with him. 
And to the back of the dog, he began asking questions, all kinds of questions. Finally, he ran out of questions, and he reached a place where his mind was a blank, and he just rested. And then the dog wheeled around, stared at him, just stared at him. A few minutes, and turned away, sat down, looked down, out above the clouds again. To the man's amazement, all of the questions he had asked suddenly had answers in his own mind. And it occurred to him that the dog had silently answered him. There had been a communication from him to the dog and from the dog to him. And the proof was that every question he had asked had an answer. Now he realized that something very unusual was happening, not only in the dog's life, but his own. He became aware that there was a transcendental presence that through him could communicate with the dog and through the dog could communicate with him. Something he had never known or suspected and something which he began day by day to prove to his complete satisfaction. And then one day at the beach, a long span of sand and water, he gave the dog free rein and just watched it. Its movements were breathtaking. Everything about the dog was living in the now. There was no past or future to this dog. He'd run into the sea and out, up and down, and then he'd rest, thinking of something to do, and then he'd do it. And everything was poetry in action. And for the first time, Boone looked out and realized something again that he had never known. Something which has to do with a rose. He looked out and he saw that up to now he had begun to think that the dog was expressing divine qualities. And now suddenly he realized that wasn't true. He suddenly knew that divine qualities were expressing a dog. In this, he reached a great mountaintop of understanding. He had caught the illusion of form and the reality of the divine which is expressing to human sense as form. And for the first time he felt that he had really seen a dog. Now as he learned more and more about this, he discovered that every way, every day, he could sit with the dog in silence and they could commune that the dog already was in perfect meditation. It was he who had to come up to the level of the dog. And when he did, if he thought, I am superior to you, I'm the human being and I'm the master here, he found that communication between him and the dog was impossible. It was only when he became totally humble and he raced all idea that he was superior to the dog and recognized that they were both spiritual being expressing in different forms then did communion take place then was there an exchange of thought and it wasn't the dog's thought or his thought it was what he called the voice of existence functioning through both of them now this this were an isolated instance it could be forgotten. It would be something only that dog lovers would care about. Let's go a few steps further, and we find then that this man now applied his knowledge in other areas. He found, for example, that rattlesnakes only bit white men. They never bit, bit Indians. And he discovered that the rattlesnake is as susceptible to meditation as the dog provided there is a witness who does not see a rattlesnake but who sees invisible spirit functioning there. And then the two-way communion again is set up and the American Indian had already perfected that. And for that reason, the Indian would walk past the rattlesnake, they would stop and pause and look at each other for a moment, and within himself the Indian would acknowledge that this is a living spiritual being an expression of what he called the big holy. And the rattlesnake 
would acknowledge the same about the Indian, and after that moment's pause, they would simply walk by each other and continue about their work. Now, what he discovered was that a rattlesnake, like the dog, could read your thoughts could translate your consciousness instantly and that is what causes the rattler to coil up and be ready to strike reading the fear of an individual the rattler becomes an enemy but being in the presence of an Indian without fear the rattler is not an enemy and this he proved to the point of being able to even handle these snakes and saw a woman in fact who trained the most deadly and poisonous snakes on this earth in a very simple and beautiful way. She too established communion with a snake and through love within and the recognition of the reality of snake was able to touch, pet, live with any kind of snake on the face of the earth regardless of the difficulty it might encounter with other human beings. In other words, the flower, the snake, the dog, these are forms. Carry it out to ponies. He wanted to find out how the Indian could ride horseback at such great speed without a saddle. Why he didn't fall off? Just hanging on to a mane wouldn't be enough. And he finally got an Indian chief who put him through several trials before he would be willing to divulge the truth and then through sign language told him that the rider and the horse had become one the rider was aware of the spiritual identity of the horse in his consciousness he accepted the oneness and this became the law and this is what made them one and what made it possible for the Indian to ride without a saddle at great speeds with great darting turns and still remain one inseparable because they had accepted inseparability in consciousness now he went on further and he discovered that the Koran was read to the ponies in Arabia it was understood that the words spoken could set up an atmosphere that would influence the development of those ponies of those Arabian horses he discovered a man who trained earthworms with a knowledge of the one infinite self expressing as all form he himself had a great success with ants as soon as he knew the reality of them they never disturbed his home again and he had a fly it waited for him at 7 a.m. in front of his shaving mirror every morning. And it stayed with him all day till 5 o'clock. And it performed acrobatics in the air. It came up to the front of his nose so he could see it and it did somersaults. And then if he put his finger up, it would light on his finger. It knew his thoughts. It knew his thoughts of love. It knew his thoughts of truth. It knew his acceptance of the fly as spiritual being, not the physical form. In fact, it was quite the talk among his circle. And one day, an unidentified actor, whom I think was Douglas Fairbanks Sr., burst into his home one night and wanted to see this fly. Well, he said, the fly leaves at 5 o'clock every day, and I don't see it after that, and I don't know where it is. So come back tomorrow. And Fairbanks said, well, I'll, take, I'll be somewhere else tomorrow. I won't be in town. And I've got to see it. I just heard too much about it. I've got to see it. Well, he said, sit down. We'll see what we can do. And so they both sat in chairs and they were very still. And in his quietness, he started to commune with a fly. Lo and behold, even though it had never been there at night before, it suddenly appeared. And right on his finger when he put his finger up, Fairbanks was amazed, leaped up, let me do that. As soon as he leaped up, the fly was on the ceiling and wouldn't come down. He was crushed. He had stood in front of matinee audiences. They had worshipped him, and here was his fly spurning him. It just couldn't take that. 
And he demanded to know why the fly ran away from him and not from the owner. And the owner said, well, I don't think he's a fly. I don't look down to him as an inferior at all. You do, and he knows it. And you know, Fairbanks just sat there quietly thinking it over. And he said, you know, I'm beginning to understand. Forgive me. And in that instant, the fly came down from the ceiling. Now, there were so many stories like this put out by Boone. And such a wonderful understanding that behind the visible is the one invisible. That few people caught this because it was written way back. The last book I saw on it was in 55, and that may not be the original, that may be the, the renewal of the copyright. The first was about the dog Strongheart, the second was a, called Kinship with All Life. And it doesn't matter who you are on the spiritual path, it's a beautiful book to have. J. Allen Boone, Kinship with All Life. I think Joel recommended it in a tape several years back. It fits in beautifully with the chapter, A Rose is a Rose is a Rose. A dog is a dog is a dog. An ant is an ant is an ant. Behind every visible form, including people, what is there? If we accept the form, we're sowing to the flesh. If we accept the spirit, we're sowing to the spirit, and then we're learning that God is the only being. God is the only being, and how can anything be imperfect? Only in human judgment. Only in the conditioned human mind. Now we have a passage in scripture which says, When two or more, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And isn't that just what Job was telling us? Ask the beasts, ask the animals, ask the fish, ask the fowl. Isn't that what Boone proved in his silent meditations with these various animals, these various creatures? Isn't this what you have discovered when you have looked out upon the world, quietly resting in the knowledge that the image maker is bringing forth forms and if I sow to the forms I'm only sowing to the images the images that will pass and what have I got left a memory of images but suppose I sow to the spirit and let the spirit itself define what is really there then we see the rose that we had thought so beautiful so glorious is all of that but it's much more. It is but a promise of beauty unseen by the naked eye. Beauty unseen by the eyeballs. Beauty that we cannot begin to even suspect with a sense mind. This is but a hint of greater things to come. And actually, if you take the teaching of Jesus that the kingdom of God is at hand, it is a hint of greater things that are at hand right now. Now go back to the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Here we are looking at these beautiful flowers. Do you realize we're content to stay that way? We're content to say this is beautiful and I will tolerate nothing else that will change my attitude toward this. But the poor in spirit can look at beauty and say beauty must be as infinite as God. And therefore this beauty that I behold now with the eye must be very insignificant in the infinite beauty behind it which is making it possible to appear here to my eye. And that is when you become ready to look at the invitation of the rose which says, walk through me. Enter me as you would enter a door and then be still and let the Spirit of God which gave utterance to me define me, 
my function, my place in the scheme of all life. And then you will find that I arose, and I a dog, I a star, I an earthworm, are all part of one great plan and one great purpose. We are the one life appearing in the multitudinous form. And only that life can define itself in the vacuum of your mind. We are transported above the limitations of mind and body into the realm where spirit defines itself. The flowers will pass. The dogs will pass. The persons will pass. The things of this world will pass. But I, the Spirit, I shall not pass, for I am thee. And to know me aright is life eternal. Not to know the form of the rose, the form of the dog. Not to know the forms of this world, but to know the essence behind the forms of this world will bring you even to a greater enjoyment of the forms. And then we will not cling to those forms. We will enjoy them at a higher level of ourselves, at a level that is not e attached emotionally, at a level that is not hurt emotionally, at a level that perceives the permanent reality behind the form. That which is ever permanent, ever perfect, not becoming good one day and bad the next. And so a rose is to be enjoyed. It is also to be a sign of an invisible, infinite love which is saying, behind this rose, I am. And when this rose departs, do not despair. When this person departs, do not despair. When this dog departs, do not despair. A rose is a rose. Name it, and that is all. A dog is a dog. A person is a person. And you are a person. But don't be stuck with that limitation. See the spiritual essence of the rose, and you will discover the spiritual essence of yourself. And then you are he who has discovered the meaning of poor in spirit. Do not be content with the form, the finite, that which has a boundary and a limitation. You are unlimited essence. The rose is unlimited essence. Remove the mask of form in all things and taste the spiritual reality that is there speaking to you as the voice of existence. Now as we do this, we too can talk with a rose. We too can talk with a dog. We too can talk with a slug in the garden. We can talk with an ant. We can talk with any person or any form of life on the face of the earth if we recognize that God is already speaking where it appears. But when two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now you are the one. And that object, that tree, that flower, that blade of grass is another one. And that is the two. And behind the two, the you and it, is the voice of existence. The spirit being itself the ever-present perfection. And you are discovering that a rose is a rose is a rose is another way of telling you to look behind to the omnipresence of spirit. Find the essence and not the effect which the mind makes as it interprets that essence. And then you're walking on earth in the kingdom of God. I am thee and thou and me. You're in communication with all that is spirit throughout the infinite universe. You have found what Boone called the lost universal language of silence the still small voice 
It would be so easy for Joel to teach us that there is no evil. We'd all jump through a hoop and say hallelujah. But he has to teach us too there is no good. There is no good that fades and no evil that fades. There is only the omnipresent spirit. And as we learn that, all of the things of this world have a new significance. We feel that even the evil is our misinterpretation of the invisible love that is there. We can rest in the knowledge that omnipresent love is all there is, and our judgments have produced that which we call evil because we had them on the second side of the coin which we call good. It is only when we eliminate the coin of judgment the two-sided coin which says this is good but that is evil that we discover we were wrong in both cases only the essence is there I and then we have the perfect universe revealed then we too are walking forth like the disciples declaring to the world the kingdom of God is at hand don't believe what you see with your eyeballs don't fall into the trap if you talk about health, you're going to have to see that there's sickness there too. But if you talk about the invisible perfection, which is here and only it, neither health nor bad health will fool you and you will find permanence in the harmony that is present. Translated into practical living, we're told by Joel that the moment you know there are not good flowers and bad weeds, good robins and bad bugs, that you can come to that inner understanding which will even change a bug from being a pest that is hurting your garden to a harmless bug. It will be restored to its function, which is always a good function, like an earthworm, which prepares the soil, which fertilizes the soil, which loosens the topsoil so that it may receive oxygen. We find the earthworm a very valuable citizen. Also, if there is any person who is doing evil, your knowledge of the non-existence of evil because of the all-presence of spirit must ultimately remove that person from the place where he can commit that evil. In short, the infinite flow of spirit is always the invisible reality of all that you see. And when you finitize an object and accept it as the reality, you are denying the presence of the spirit which through the glass darkly of human vision becomes that visible effect. You are pulling down the blinds on infinity, separating yourself from it. And so a rose does have a beautiful texture, a beautiful color, a beautiful aroma. But there is no place on this earth where God is not. Let us enjoy the effects but let us never lose sight of the fact that God alone is being. And as this becomes your consciousness, God alone is being, you will be able to look at the bush which is threadbare, full of holes, and in your quietness, you will commune with that bush, you will let the voice through you through it, which is ever there expressing as the word, the presence, the life, the love, restore that image to the truth of its invisible essence through your enlightened consciousness, for you and the bush are the two or more who are gathered in my name. And you are that one who is the majority with God. Now we have been given this dominion 
to the extent that we practice it, to the extent that we deny all that which would tempt us into the belief that God is not functioning where the bush appears to be bitten by the worms or by the slugs or by the aphids. God is functioning there. We are looking at universal consciousness outpictured and we're saying it's an aphis biting our tree. It isn't. It's universal consciousness made visible. And we must escape that false cosmic consciousness which is bearing false witness to the presence of God where we stand. When the poem was written by Browning, Paracelsus, he had caught all of this. He had caught what Job said about communing with the animals to discover the truth, what Boone discovered with his dog and his rattlesnakes and his ants and his flies, and what Joel has taught us, the imprisoned splendor. The one great thing that Boone further found was in response to his quest to discover how could a combat dog be so transformed from a vicious, aggressive, belligerent animal ready to go at your throat in a moment to a friendly, loving, affectionate, sharing dog. And he found his answer, he said, not from the trainer. He found it instead by communing with the dog and letting the dog teach him what it knew about itself. And it taught him that it had become aware of its own spiritual presence and in letting that presence flow out through within itself, it had expressed qualities that were in itself, qualities that were imprisoned, but were ever present, divine qualities that were there. And later he had this confirmed by the trainer, that the trainer had discovered that all of the aggressive qualities of the dog were but the outer picture of the human mind. And when he found the center within the dog, the qualities of love and sharing, selflessness, courage, all of these were there in the dog waiting to be released. And so it is that Browning captured that. If you don't remember the poem, it goes this way. Truth is within ourselves. And that's to tell us that we who are looking for truth out there or for reality out there are making a mistake. Truth is within ourselves. And that means all truth. It takes no rise from outward things, whatever you may believe. There is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness and around, wall upon wall, the gross flesh hems it in. This perfect, clear perception, which is truth, a baffling and perverting carnal mesh binds it and makes all error. And to know rather consists in opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape than in effecting entry for a light supposed to be without. Now Browning caught what this trainer caught in the dog. What he discovered is true of every dog, of every flower, of every effect. In it is an inmost center where the truth is imprisoned, waiting for the witness to come along. And when that truth is unimprisoned, it expresses the fullness of God the total, complete, infinite individuality of that form comes forth. So with us. This inmost center containing the truth of our being 
is the infinity of spirit. And we must not be content to rest with the finite observations of the beautiful things of this world, but to press on further through the material, through the texture, through the shape and size and fragrance, through all that we consider good, into the depth of its spiritual center, poor, until we reach that center of spirit which enriches us. And then we see that flower as an infinite expression, not a finite little form, and we begin to suspect the infinite nature of our own being. We can walk through a world of invisible flowers, a world of invisible perfection. We actually can walk in the living love of the living spirit. We can feel our physical form as an effect of that love. And as we do, we are one with spirit. I live in it and it lives in I. One and the same, abiding. Now go back to your first commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, with all thy mind. Why didn't it just say one thing? Because you have to turn over the images of your mind to a higher source. Because all of you must come above being content with form. It is a total surrender of the total human self. A surrender to the infinite invisible. Not only in yourself, but in all of the world around you. So that every person and everything becomes your opportunity to commune with the infinite. When I see you, I know that the voice can speak through us both if I am still. And that is how we find our harmony. When you see another, if you will be still in the recognition that the voice of existence speaks through them as well as you, in its own way, to the degree that you remove the belief of separation, of superiority over any form on this earth, you will find you have purified. You have removed the major obstacle, judgment. And if you had judged, that same judgment is meted back unto you. If you had judged, you judged unrighteously. For the only righteous judgment there are is there is, is no judgment whatsoever. And in that no judgment, you are one with the universe one with all life and then all life speaks to all life through you what a man did with a dog you can do with the universe around you what the mystic has learned we are learning in many many ways now try it in your garden try it in your homes try it in all your relationships with those things which are organic and inorganic. And you will discover invisible life speaks through invisible life where there is the removal of the personality, of the false consciousness, of the false sense of self. Where there is bird and woman. And woman is aware that bird and I are forms of the one spirit there will be the voice of existence present and communicating between bird and woman, between flower and woman, between man and woman, between child and woman. All forms can communicate through you if you will remove your judgment that they are forms and know them and yourself as the one spirit. This is the path that beckons to us. It is the path of faith in the unseen. Moving past even the visible beauties into the infinite, where beauty never changes.
We're going to end this with a kind of a new Lord's Prayer. This Lord's Prayer is the same that Jesus taught, and yet it's another way of looking at it. As you sit there, think of me for a moment and know that I am not here. Only God is here. Now go back to yourself and know that you are not there. Only God is there. Dwell on this, that you are not there, God is. I am not here, God is. And rest in the knowledge that only God is here. We are not. You will find this is the Lord's Prayer. As this truth takes root in you, you will find it is a truth that you can depend upon anywhere at any time. Never is there any other presence than God. Regardless of the form that may be confronting you or behind you or in your future or your past, never is there another presence than God. When you nullify the belief in the other form and in your own, in the knowledge that only God is here, only Spirit, you are in the one and the one will express its perfection where you stand. It will guide you. It will go before you. It will perfect all that concerns you. It will perform all you are appointed to do. It will readjust all of the visible world around you to lay harmony at your doorstep. The power of the infinite will function where you stand when you remove that consciousness which sows to form and accepts one invisible spirit infinitely present, infinitely perfect, infinitely functioning here where I stand, there where you stand, now and forever. This is the Christ consciousness which walks in the kingdom of God on earth and not in the forms that appear to human eyes. You will do this to the degree that you practice it. And then you will be in the one power, the one life, the one law, the one being, the one infinite self perfectly expressing everywhere at all times. That will be walking with God, practicing the presence of the one spirit without opposite. Now this meditation is very powerful. And you'll find whenever you're beset by a problem of any nature, your realization that the problem is not there, God is, and I am not here, God is, and rest in the word, the power of omnipotence, of omnipresence, of omniscience will flow through from the invisible into the visible, destroying the illusion of problem. It is a very simple meditation and it covers every word in the Lord's Prayer. We might discuss that further in the second half among other things. God is there. God is here. All else is the image of the false world consciousness. And in that we rest.